Today we have 2021, 2022, and 2023 U.S. Open champion on Rajiv Ram. Rajiv, welcome back. Glad to be here. So I had Michael Jordan scheduled for today, but when you won <laughs> a few weeks ago, I told him to step aside and I said Rajiv just won his third consecutive U.S. Open. So tell us, how does one three-peat? I would have loved to have listened to Michael Jordan. Why do you have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, look, maybe, I'll, it was maybe I'll have both of y'all on next time. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was an unbelievable tournament for us. Um, how does one three beat? I, I don't really. I I wish I had a, a formula for that, but um, <laughs> something special about that place, you know, definitely for Joe and I um, over the last few years. He, even the year before, you know, we we made the semis and we lost a tough one. We we played well there for for a long time now and um to to actually get over the line this year um given that we haven't you know necessarily had our best year in terms of results uh, was was incredibly special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to talk about this season. Um there's a few times so I'll, I'll check the the um ATP doubles race rankings every couple of weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And you all season wasn't going I, I imagine according to plan and I remember there was a few times I tweeted out about your ranking and y'all were around like 16 or 19 at one point. And I was like, this, this might be the first year y'all don't make the ATP finals as a pair. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, I think y'all made like five consecutive or something. Yeah. Four. And then, yeah. The first four years we played, we did. Yeah. This was four. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so now y'all are all the way up to, I think six in the race, um, mm -hmm. with the U S open win. What do you make of the season since it has been a, a little bit of a roller coaster and, and a little bit different for y'all? Yeah, you know, I mean, it it happens, I think. You know, I mean, we've had four, mm -hmm. maybe not four full ones, but three and a half amazing years. Um, you know, 19, we just started playing and, and the back half of that was really good. And um 2021 20, and 22 were all, you know, we're all incredible. I think we qualified for Turin before the U S open started even in those years. And obviously 20 was a little bit weird with COVID and all, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. we wanted to open that year. So we, we were basically in it um, right after the first month. And so, you know, it, it's gonna, it's imp in my opinion, it's, it's impossible to just keep going. You're going to, you're going to definitely have those waves. And, you know, we were dealing with a couple of injuries. Joe's back hasn't been great. And my Achilles is, give me a lot of trouble throughout this year. I, I basically took all of February off to try and, you know, get it right or get it better. And it, it didn't really, um, it didn't really go as well as, as I'd hoped or as quickly as I would have hoped. And the, and the surfaces were, were a tough thing for me to play on clay and, and to play on the grass with that. So, um, you know, we had a few things going against us for sure. Um, but, you know, I think we always knew that if we were able to put some good work in and we were able to sort of turn that corner of, playing well, you know, that we could get on a roll and, and we were still, you know, going to be very difficult to beat. And um, that sort of, I felt like what happened this summer, we were able to put in a lot of hours, a lot of good work. And even though results didn't come straight away or as consistently as, as we would have liked, we knew that if we kind of got the ball rolling, we, we were still going to be very, very difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like it was maybe partly at least a product of like consecutive weeks healthy? Um, that kind uh, of led into yeah, the yeah. And okay. it, for sure, uh, that was a, a big part of it. Um, and not even necessarily tournament weeks or result weeks. It was, it was just more consistent work that we could put in to, to be at the level that we knew we needed to be at for a, for a big run at the U S open. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, what, what is something you learned about either yourself or you and Joe as a team this season? Um, that, you know, even if it comes, even if there's moments or, or stretches of, of not very good results and not very good play that, you know, we were able to find that with, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen with work and it's going to happen with dedication and it's going to happen with all that. But if we do put all that in, even if, you know, for six months, it, the results weren't there that we are still able to compete, you know, with the best teams in the world and, and play at a, a super high level. So, Mm -hmm. Um, I think if anything, it just made me feel more like we, we have that in us, um, and it doesn't have to always be there for us to find it again, which is a, which is a nice feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I remember last time we talked, uh, you were, uh, locked in your hotel in Australia, um, yeah. during in quarantine, I think for like 10 or 14 days. Um, and 
we talked about the no ad and then 10 point tiebreaker format. And, and I remember you saying, I think you said you would rather get rid of the no ad than get rid of the 10 point tiebreaker. Yeah. Um, how much of maybe, you know, if you call it like a lack of results or, or kind of a, a down early part of the season, how much of it do you attribute to that? Because with that short format outside of the grand slams, it seems like you can play a really good match and still lose to a good team um, multiple weeks in a row just because there's so much left to chance on some of those no ad points and, and the 10 point tiebreakers. Um, yeah. For us specifically this year, I don't attribute that much of it to that. I mean, we, okay. we lost first round at Wimbledon when it was, you know, full scoring, we lost, yeah. you know, third round, which isn't terrible, but third round at the French and at the Australian open. So I don't really think it, it has anything to do with that. Like I said, it, it's more about the fact that we weren't able to, you know, put in regular continuous, you know, good day after day after day to, to sort of get us to that point when we were in a tough situation that we honestly believe like we deserve to get out of it. And I think that mm -hmm. was the biggest difference is that when we were in those tough situations at the U S open, we believed that we deserved to get out of it because of the fact that we put the work in beforehand mm -hmm. and earlier in the year, you know, I think we were hoping to get out of it, um, mm. to get out of those tough situations. And there's a huge difference between hoping and, and believing like you deserve it. And um, that only happens if you're able to put in that that work. And and we weren't able to do that for for a large part of this year. Interesting. OK, that's a that's a good distinction. So believing you should get out of it because you've been healthy for long enough to put in the the hours and put in the, the match play and the practice versus yeah. just being a little more hopeful. Uh, I like that yeah. a lot. Um, so you have a new coach, Chris Eaton. Talk about that a little bit. How did that relationship start? How did that decision kind of come about? Yeah, it, actually, it's it's funny. It's, it's not really new. Uh, Chris Chris and I started working together, you know, remotely since 20, uh, in 2017. Um, oh, the year okay. that I decided to stop playing singles, um, I called him up because the year before that, he worked with Continent and Piers. And so he had, you know, been coaching against me, let's say, um, a little bit here and there. And then he took mm -hmm. the job at Wake Forest as the assistant. So he was, you know, full time doing that. But I called him up and I said, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm doing this doubles thing now. He's a guy that I'd known for a long time. I played against him um, as a player. And then obviously, like I said, as a coach. And so I said, you know, do you think we could we could work together? You could help me kind of, you know, really understand how this how this works. And so we actually did two weeks of uh, of offseason training while he was recruiting at the Eddie Hur and the Orange Bowl down in Florida, I went down and we would do um, sessions in the evening, kind of when those matches were over. And so we had two good, two good weeks there and have sort of developed this system of, of you know, chatting and talking and, and going through things, you know, over the phone remotely and then meeting up whenever we could. Um, he would be at the slams recruiting for the for the college. And so we would come out and help whenever whenever he was around. Um, it wasn't as much as it would be ideal, obviously, but it's not certainly something mm -hmm. that was brand new um sure and then just this year he decided that he wanted to fully step away from that and we had worked it out where he could uh join us on the road full time and or yeah more or less full time and so we started traveling together fully at the french but it's by no means uh, a new thing got it okay that makes a lot of sense what, what's yeah. uh what's something that he brings to the table being on the road full time for you what what are kind of his best assets as a as a coach I mean, you know, I think it's it's familiarity for me. I mean, that's the thing that makes mm -hmm. me be able to compete, you know, day in and day out at the highest level, sort of get to that space where I am fully locked in and I'm fully, you know, um, yeah, fully dialed in to, to be able to really bring the best out of me as a competitor. Um, I think mm -hmm. familiarity and, and and comfort is a, is a huge part of that for me personally as a player. So, like I said, he's someone who's been there from the very beginning of me starting to play doubles exclusively and um, he's seen the ups and the downs. I've gone through a couple of partners and I've gone through a couple of different situations like that. So it's someone that I know I can fully trust and I can fully um, rely on and who really knows me as a player and as a person incredibly well. So I think that that is it, you know, that's the biggest part of it. It's just that sort of uh, comfort level. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so you just finished Davis cup last mm -hmm. year obviously there was a little bit of drama around that um not making the team uh talk about davis cup how was that you, you and austin went uh two and one i think the only loss was a, a 10 point tiebreaker because the match was yeah. decided yeah um 
How was the Davis Cup experience? Oh man, it was. Look, anytime I get the opportunity to play for for my country and for the U.S., I'm going to take it. I'm going to play as hard as I can. It's it's as important to me as as anything else is is winning the U.S. Open. You know, if 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 we are able to or are, are ever able to win the Davis Cup, it'll be right up there with any Slam that I've won or anything like that. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, our our two matches were great. I thought. We did, you know, we did everything we could and we competed great, especially on the back of a tough trip. We both did well at the U.S. Open. You know, as you said, he, he made the semis. I made, obviously, you know, ended up winning it. And so it was not easy to get over there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the teams we played against were were really tough. I think our singles guys played their hearts out, just unfortunately came up on the on the wrong side of a few matches and couldn't get through as a team, which was disappointing for everyone, for sure. Um, you know, I was encouraged greatly by the way that Austin and I played for hopefully future situations in Davis cup and the Olympics and whatnot. Um, yeah, but it was overall, you know, you go there to win as a team. And so you win and lose as a team, no matter what. And so it was yeah, yeah. pretty disappointing that we didn't get through that. Yeah. So are you, uh, planning to play with Austin at the Olympics? I know that's probably not like totally decided, but yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think, um, that's the plan right now. I mean, we're sitting here at September of the year before, so a lot of things can happen between now and, uh is it august yeah august of next year it's almost so, a yeah. year a full year away which is yeah. a long time in, in tennis players lives for sure but yeah as of now i mean that's the idea um you know we we've known each other for a long time and i think we both love to play with each other so that would be yeah that'd be the, the idea awesome yeah i'm sure y'all will be uh one of the favorites heading into it for sure assuming everybody's healthy yeah um what about 2024 any uh plans uh outside of the olympics for 2024 Nothing yet. I mean, you know, we still have a a fair bit of this season left for sure. I think, you know, we're, we're really, one thing is that we get to go play in Asia, which we haven't done over the last three years. So, you know, that's um, a difference for sure. Um, And then we still have, you know, basically at two thousands left in Shanghai and Paris and Joe and I haven't, haven't won one of those yet this year. So I think that's a big goal of ours to try and get one of those. And then we're defending the title in Turin. So, um, you know, there's a lot of really important tennis to be played. I know it's kind of weird because everyone feels like, season sort of yeah. slowed down or ends after the u.s open and then it's just not the case so uh you know right. 24 is is still a ways away so we're still you know going to do our best to to really try and finish 23 strong you know probably especially more so because we didn't start 23 as well as we would have liked so yeah mm-hmm. yeah that makes sense so a couple of uh so a lot of the listeners are kind of club level uh doubles players mm-hmm. i want to ask a couple of um, questions for them. So what advice would you have for players or teams that aren't, that are maybe in a little bit of a dip, um, and they're not doing so well, and this could be during maybe a a league season or, uh, even during a particular match, maybe you lose the first set, you're not playing as well. Um, how do you kind of handle that yourself and what advice would you have in that situation? Yeah. I mean, for me, it, we'll start with the match in specific. Um, for me, I think usually when I don't feel like I'm playing my best, it's for some, for some reason I'm not in the right state of mind, you know, I'm not in that competitive state of mind. So I, you know, figuring out, just thinking, having that clarity to think about, okay, what is it that's going on? Am I, am I nervous? Am I flat? Am I tired from the day before or some other reason? Am I, you know, distracted? Like, what is it that's actually not allowing me to, to sort of be in that right mindset? And then and then dealing with that, I feel like once you can identify the issue and just sort of put it out there to yourself even, um, or maybe even to your partner, you know, that's a big thing for Joe and I is that we're able to, you know, say, hey, listen, I'm feeling, you know, this way for this reason. And and just even saying it and putting it out there sometimes takes a lot of the, the, the anxiety away from it, right? And so, hmm. um, you know, I'll give you a great example this year at the US Open it was that that happened right I mean we were getting smoked in the finals of the first you know in the finals of the first set we got we got smoked and I was like man Joe I'm, I'm just a little flat like we had a quick turnaround the day before like I know it's the finals of the US Open and I'm trying to get myself up for it but it's just not happening and and then we just sort of said okay once I said that it was like okay we're we can try and um try and deal with deal with it one point at a time, you know, take little small gains, small wins, and, and hopefully build myself and our team back up to that level of competitiveness. And it, and it happened to work this time. We drew on past experiences because two years ago, we were in the exact same position and, you know, we were able to come out on the good end of it. So a lot of times just identifying what that is, is, is a big part of dealing with it in, you know, mid-match. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, I like that because 
you're using your partner to kind of help lift you up, which I, I feel like a lot of club level players maybe don't do. Maybe they kind of internalize it and keep it to themselves. Um, yeah, that's a big you are, deal. You are a team, so you have yeah. to be communicating that information to each other. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, so another thing, um, I watched a couple of y'all's matches, and one thing I feel like you do really well. I don't know if you do this. I was talking to um to dave about this and i i feel like y'all lob return a little bit more often than some other teams how do you decide when to lob versus hit cross court versus hit down the line is there something you're looking for from the other team or is it matchup dependent where you've kind of scouted and decided before the match or some combination uh talk about your your return uh decisions yeah, I mean, so some of it's definitely matchup dependent. If you know a team, you've played them before, you know they serve really well, and you know the the their service partner position is very aggressive, close to the net, or they're very good at it. You know, you feel like oh, even if I hit a good one, they're going to be able to knock it off and put you on defense. I mean, so then you know mm -hmm. the only way to kind of get the point started is to is to lob uh, a bit. Some of it's in the mid match if you feel like oh, I'm the original plan was trying to hit and, you know, hit either down line cross court or kind of start the point that way, but it's just not working. Either you're having a bad day returning or they're serving really well, or some kind of condition isn't really there. I think that, I mean, the lob is such a vi vital and valuable play and especially in men's doubles off the return because the guys just serve so big and so well that mm -hmm. quite often you kind of get taken out of the game a little bit, you know, and, uh, Sometimes you can just, if nothing else, even if you lose the point, you push the service partner back off the net a little bit. So it gives you a little bit more space to hit. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, sometimes it's predetermined. Sometimes it's mid-match, but we, we go to it quite often. Like we try not to get too far in the hole of just, you know, easy hold after easy hold before at least trying, trying that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's something you said there was, even if you lose the point, it might push the server's partner off the net. So that's, that's something I feel like a lot of people miss, right? Like, oh, I hit the lob return. Well, it didn't work. I guess I'm like, I guess that was useless. Yeah. But in re in reality, that might, like you said, pull the partner, the service partner off the net and then open up the cross court return or maybe exactly. allow you to get it to their feet a little bit more. Um, so I think that's a really important point that I want to highlight there uh, for the yeah. listeners. Yeah. So I, quite often it's a setup for the rest of the set game match whatever as opposed to that one specific point right um we talked a little bit um or i mentioned 10 point tiebreakers earlier uh do you have any routines or advice for players who maybe struggle to win 10 point tiebreakers is there anything that that you can do to to kind of try to play your best during those moments yeah i mean we as a team we just try to be as physical as possible in those moments. Right. I mean, I feel like the 10 point tiebreakers, especially obviously lots on the line and and maybe the, the natural reaction is to potentially go in your shell a little bit or just not be as free. And, and, you know, you think about the result, you're, you know, a lot of things, right. There's a lot of things right mm -hmm. in there. And, and for us, if we're just sort of focused on being as, as physical as possible, you know, it's running your hardest, jumping your hardest, you know, split stepping really like really the basics of physicality in tennis that seems to help us in those moments just be a little bit sharper and a little bit better because i think it's you know it's too difficult at that point to think about too much strategy or too much definitely too much technical stuff you, you gotta really yeah. dumb it down for yourself because there's a lot going on you know and um mm -hmm. so i feel like um that's the thing that we kind of had as the basics um and that means different things to different people some people have to jump around move their feel well some people have to maybe get a little bit more locked in with their eyes you know i, I don't really know i think that's different from person to person but we uh we just uh, try to try to really focus on that part of it in those you know mm. break especially so when you say physicality um you mentioned kind of focusing on moving your feet more and and running as hard as you can uh, I, I think some listeners might hear, okay, I'm going to try to hit the ball harder. Is that what you're talking about as well or, or not necessarily? No, the, not, not no. at all. Actually, okay. hitting the ball okay. is, is sort of the result of all of that stuff, you know? Okay. Um, I think that's know, When we talk about physicality, we, we kind of talk about, about everything but hitting the ball because the hitting the ball part should sort of, in my opinion, be a result of the rest of the stuff. Your, your mm -hmm. focus, your concentration, your 
how much you move your feet, how, how physical, physical you are with, with all that stuff. And then it's kind of like the hitting the ball part should just happen, you know, cause if you just focus too much on that, I feel like that's where you kind of get in trouble with the rest of it. You know, you're focusing on the mm-hmm. result more as opposed to the process there. And um, so that's sort of the, we try to do things to, to lessen that, you know, cause you mm-hmm. have what you have on the day. Some days you're going to hit the ball. Great. Some days you're not going to hit the ball. Great. But maybe you can just make it a little bit better by, by being better in those other areas. Right. Yeah. I feel like focusing on the footwork is, is super important because when players get tied, especially at our level, um, they struggle with their upper body and their, their swing. They'll kind of maybe um, not follow through or like not swing freely. Right. Um, yeah. and, and miss. So if you can focus on your feet, then you're not as worried about your upper body and it'll just kind of take care of itself a little bit more. That's exactly right. Yeah. Freely. Uh, so several questions here from some fans on Instagram. Uh, number one, what changes did you make to your game while transitioning from singles to doubles? You know, it wasn't really that many changes in my tennis. It was more some of this other stuff that we're talking about, right? Like in singles, if you have a bad day competing or a bad day mentally, you can't share it with anyone. You just have to figure it out yourself. And like I said, some mm-hmm. of the stuff that, and we as tennis players, I mean, I played singles for you know, 30 years or whatever it was, you know, maybe, yeah, whatever, really long. And so you, you get in these habits of, if something is there, you just deal with it yourself and you almost don't look to try and, you know, lean on a partner. And and then all of a sudden when you are playing doubles, you have that option and that ability and a lot, oftentimes it helps. So it's just like being able to say, Hey, listen, you know, this is what I'm feeling today. And I'm, you know, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling bad. I'm nervous. I'm happy. I'm sad, whatever it might be that might help the team. And also listening to your partner when they have something to say and try to, you know, deal with it together. So um, just sort of being aware of that and being open to doing it has, was probably the biggest change for me. It it was much less about the tennis and more about the competitiveness. Hmm. Did that take some time? Is there anything you did to kind of learn that i guess any any sort of training you did to learn to be more open with your communication i mean just like anything else it's just practice you know so Experience. that doesn't just happen in matches right when we have a, we're having a practice day and i'm going to say hey joe listen today um you know this is bothering me a little bit i'm going to serve a little bit less or i'm going to or i'm feeling great today i'm going to really treat this like it's a match even though it's practice you do whatever you want to do but this is how i'm going to treat it today so it's like mm-hmm. you know doing those things in, in practice on a daily basis, then all of a sudden when a match comes along, it's much easier to, to do it as opposed to the first time you're going to try and do it is in a, in a match is, is quite often hard. You know, you don't even know what you're thinking yourself sometimes, let alone trying to uh, express it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, so next question, tips for female partners in mixed. What do you mean? Like what should, <laughs> uh that that's all the context i have so (laughs) yeah i guess i guess doubles uh tips double strategy tips or tactical tips for um the female partner in mixed i mean i think the one thing is is that you know obviously if there's a a choice oftentimes like if you're both at the net like you're probably going to get more of the balls coming at you you know so just Mm -hmm. being being ready as best as you can that you know, the ball is probably going to come at you if there's a choice and, and that's okay. Like, that's totally fine. It's, it's not like anyone, it makes it worse or better, or you're supposed to have more pressure, just, just being, just being ready that the balls are, are going to come at you. And then also being aware that, you know, when there's a choice for you to hit it, it's probably good to, to pick on the girl a little bit, especially if there's a situation to make him hit an overhead or make him hit, you know, something to where the guys might be a little bit stronger. So I just think, you yeah. know, a little, a little bit of awareness that, you know, you're going to be picked on and there's somebody on the other side to be to, that you can pick on is, is probably the best because the best mixed partners I've had are, are, they do just that. They know, they know that, you know, they, they know that they're going to get more balls, but that's okay. And they know where to hit them when they, when they have a chance. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching, uh, I, th- I think it was the mixed final a couple of weeks ago and Renee Stubbs was calling it <laughs> and yeah. she was, she was so funny. Cause she was just, I, I forgot who it was. It might've been Austin or, um, yeah austin and jess were in the finals of- harry won it um it, it might have been a semi-final match i don't know but there was somebody who like wasn't picking on the girl enough at least yeah. according to renee and she was <laughs> like why is he lobbing the guy like that is the dumbest thing you can do yeah. it was just so funny listening yeah. to her yeah um 
but yeah, typically lobbing the the girl, I, I think, is a a good tactic because yeah. usually they're a little shorter, um, that it have a less of a wingspan, not as big of an overhead. Um, yeah, exactly. But yeah, listening to Renee the other day was hysterical. That reminded me of that. That's funny. Um, a couple of quick ones. Uh, do you prefer to serve into the wind or with the wind? You know, I I usually serve on the tougher side whether it's the sun or the wind or whatever, when, when Joe and I play, um, if I had my choice, yeah, I'd, I'd like to serve with the wind. Um, that okay. almost helps, but yeah, I'm okay. I, I, I'll, I'll deal with that. I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I, I can usually serve. Okay. On whatever, whichever side. Yeah. Well, why do you choose the tougher side? Just cause you're, uh, because a I, bit yeah, we, just, we just feel like, yeah, we feel like my serve is his serve is easier to hold. If it's, you know, we've got a little wind behind it or if there's not a sun mm-hmm. issue or whatever. Yeah. Okay um any funny moments with joe that you can share it's kind of open-ended yeah that's very open-ended um (laughs) hmm off the top of my head i'll have to get back to you i'll think i'll think of one but i I can't think of something off the top of my head we we do a pretty good job of keeping it pretty you know business business business-like on the court we have a good time yeah i'm any funny moments i can't think of one i mean he's (laughs) He tends to be a little late sometimes and miss some flights and do some goofy things like that. But it's- <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> what's what's a flight that he's missed? Um, can't remember what specific one, but sometimes he like you know shows up at the airport and he's booked the wrong date or something. You know, he, he's not he's not the best with his admin. So <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Okay. Uh, tell us what happened when you ordered sushi during the finals. Yeah, that's that's kind of taken off, huh? That that's really um it's really yeah. come alive that sushi bill. <laughs> Um, I actually did it in the semis too. Uh, it, it was nothing more than I just felt like I was a little bit like it was a really tough semifinal match. And, um, you know, I just felt like I was, I needed a little fuel. That was it. And I, I, mm-hmm. I eat sushi quite a lot, quite often, like right before I play. Cause it's easy to, for me, it's easy to digest and it goes down. All right. And so I know they have those, those packets in the, in the restaurant. So I asked one for one during the semi and then we had a super quick turnaround. I think we finished about four, four thirty in the afternoon on Thursday and we had to turn around and play at noon on Friday, um, in the, in the final. And so sort of the same kind of thing was happening. I just, I didn't want it to get that far. I felt like I could sort of feel like I was needing a little fuel. And so I asked for another one. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's so I almost took one out for the final and I thought, nah, I should be all right. Cause I ate a better meal and all that, but yeah, I needed it. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. I sushi, during a tennis match just sounds like a terrible idea to i me. know but, it does you know. to a lot of people but <laughs> it works fine for me so yeah, yeah. What, whatever works for you exactly um okay so the last couple questions here uh last time we chatted i asked you ha- how we can make doubles more popular you talked about more time on the big courts i've got some notes here on it um stronger marketing efforts you said people are drawn to stories and if you can make it a little bit more personal rather than just an opening act for singles, then that can help. Um, how, how are you feeling about kind of the state of doubles and what um, what do you think still uh, needs to change? I mean, I I didn't remember those exact answers that I said, but I would agree with all of them. I still think that's the biggest yeah. thing. For example, I mean, you know, it's not just because it's me. Um but you know, we won just won three U.S. Opens in a row, and that's not happened in the Open era. And I feel like if something were to have happened in singles that's not happened in the Open era, you and every other tennis fan would know about it. You know, mm-hmm. and I feel like what a great opportunity to tell a story to make doubles a little bit more personable and and you know all that to a fan is that look, there's a team out there that's just done this um, last mm-hmm. year. You know, a good friend of mine, Jules Roger, won a slam at 42 years old, I want to say. I think he was the oldest slam winner. And it's like, you know, how cool would that be to, you know, maybe relatable to someone that's playing at the club level that's about that age, that's, you know, doing their thing on the club. And you're like, man, a person your age has just won the French Open. Like, it's an incredible effort. And so we have these stories that are happening. Um, Mm -hmm. They genuinely are happening. Um, but I feel like where where they're where we're missing is capitalizing on the fact that that they are and uh, making that sort of pretty well known to the tennis community that uh, you know that 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 they should watch doubles for these reasons because I think it's I think it's some pretty cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, just better marketing of those stories for sure. Um, yeah. 
what change would you make if you were given, you know, all the power to make one change in tennis to help doubles? What change would you make? I would make it in all of tennis and I would make it so that people are able to come in and out of courts more easily. I think the most ridiculous thing that we have in tennis yeah. is that we, you, someone turns up to a match and it's 15 love of the first game and they got to wait three full games to get in. Like I, yeah. you know, I would, I would be over it at that point, yeah. you know, <laughs> that could be, that could be 30 minutes, you know, the way that some of these singles matches are going right now, you could be waiting in line for 30 minutes. Can you imagine buying a ticket for a basketball game and you said, hang on a minute, you can't actually watch what you've come to watch <laughs> because of some, for some reason like that, you got to wait a half an hour. Like I, that wouldn't go over very well. So I feel like right. in tennis in general, we sometimes don't think of it from the fans perspective as much as we should. And I think, mm -hmm. I don't think we can do much because I think it's quite a great spectacle that, that we can put on, but I feel like that's one of the biggest issues. I would let people have a little bit more freedom, maybe, okay. Maybe not at the right at the back of the court, maybe something, but some capacity of movement would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was talking about this with a coach um, in New York, actually, and we we agreed on that. And we said the back of the court. So if you take like take the back of the court and then go, we'd have a certain level where, where we'd cut it off. So it might be like 20 feet above the height of the court or 30 yeah. feet above the height of the court. And yeah. like those particular seats, like you do have to wait for a game change or a changeover or something, but everyone else should be allowed to move around the stadium. Great. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Them. Try, let's try that. You know, let's try something to make it more. Fan something. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Cause it is uh, no fun at all to sit outside, uh, yeah. outside there. No other sport has that. So awesome. Uh, any final requests to the audience? Any final comments, Rajiv, before we let no, you go? I mean, I look, I appreciate what you do. Your slogan of watch more doubles. I think it's amazing. You know, <laughs> I think, uh, men and, you know, women's doubles, mixed doubles. I mean, we're the only sport. I shouldn't say the only, I, I, I gotta say we're probably one of the few sports that, you know, we compete for major titles and Olympic medals and in, in, in mixed, you know, men and women playing against men and women. It's pretty cool. I think it's a, a, a great dynamic. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think doubles of all kind is, is, is great. I think people play it more than they play singles at the recreational level. So um, yeah, we, we'd love to have every, anyone and everyone that come to watch, uh, watch us play. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks Rajiv. Thanks everyone for listening and I will talk to you all next week. If you want to become a smarter doubles player and start winning more matches, then join the tennis tribe double strategy newsletter. Every single Thursday, I'll send you a new doubles tip or tactic that you can use in your very next match. And when you join, you're gonna get a free guide on how to play with more confidence and start dominating at the net in doubles. My name's Will, I'm the founder of the Tennis Tribe, and over the last five years, I've worked with players at every level of the game, from USTA 3-0 players, all the way to Division I college programs, as well as some of the top 10 doubles players in the world. And on Thursdays with this strategy newsletter, I share that knowledge and advice that I've gained over the years with you. So to sign up, you can go to thetennistribe.com. And again, you'll get that free net play guide when you join.